can we do? Can you check, check with me? Check, check. 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 One, two. One, two. Three, four. Three, four. Five, five six, six. Seven, eight. Seven, eight. Nine, ten. Nine, ten. Bing, bang, boom. Bing, bing bang, boom. Welcome back to Transfiguration in Oakdale, Minnesota. Transfiguration exists to bring all those in the East Metro to Christ, the source and summit of our daily and eternal lives. And you just heard my daughter. She's actually five. She's really, she's four and a half from her birth, but we say five because she's five years old. But she just spent nine months and five days in mama's tummy before she graced us with her presence. So I hope you enjoy that. I am Oh, Justin Cordham, I'm here with Father Lynch today. Hi. That, no, that, you know, that is really um, relevant to the conversation today. I think we're going to, we're going to be talking about like the what, as I've tried to understand our religion better and with greater precision, I think the, um, we, we speak of, of the Lord's, the Lord's birth and, we have uh, his conception, which is a bit confusing because the the celebration of his conception is called the Annunciation as opposed mm-hmm. to the conception, but the Annunciation. So he that is in a in a certain sense the principle or the the in the first in time feast of the incarnation. Yeah, and then I would say, you know, in our tradition we've we've have different manifestations or epiphanies when he's revealed to someone or in a particular way and the major three revelations would be the epiphany the magi the baptism in the jordan and the wedding feast at Cana or in the tradition. Those are the three that are considered revelations of epiphany. But I would say, I would say, and this is not Catholic theology, I, I think that the nativity, Christmas, is is sort of the ultimate manifestation. He already existed but he has become he is revealed he, he is revealed in that we can see him now in a way mm-hmm. that we couldn't see him before so we're going to i think i'm i think i'm taking your job a little bit but i think why i got excited about it is that we're going to be talking about revelation or revealing but probably maybe not in the way that that people would anticipate i like that no, I don't think you're taking my job. My job is to help people know Christ uh, more fully and to fall in love with Him and give their lives to Him. So, okay. I don't. I don't pretend to be like a podcast. Uh, oh, what's host? Okay. I guess it's I am hosting, but oof, yeah, that's like saying I'm a runner. That's if sure. you watched me run, you'd say possibly not. Not so much. <laughs> it's not as ugly as my swimming, but you know, ugly. Because ugly, ugly yeah. is the it's opposite of beautiful. Beautiful. It's my running is yeah. Maybe that's a good trend. That's a good transition, huh? Yes. My running. If you were to see it, it might not be manifesting the uh, beautiful beautifulness that it should be. It is. Uh, it falls short of what it could be. It yeah. falls short of excellence. That's for sure. 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 In lots of ways. Oof. I don't. Yeah, I wouldn't want to see it at all. I hope no one ever records it. Yeah. You would say that's a that's that might not be running. That be might be jogging, moving something in a very inefficient locomotion. manner. Locomotion. Yeah, locomotion. That that's definitely true. Yeah, so we just had we just hosted Dr. Dennis McNamara, which you have a very 
interesting connection to as a infant, right? Yes, yes. We speaking of uh, Jesus and his infancy. We we met when we were infants. My I don't know the details. My mom knows him, and, and Doctor McNamara knows him better than I. But our our moms were were friends when we were infants. They lived, I think they probably both lived in Comac, New York, which is on Long Island. And um, we moved to Connecticut when I was three. So uh, any regular daily, weekly contact they had ceased, but they they, uh, they kept in touch over the years and their family uh, visited our family in Connecticut, I think more than once. And, and uh, yeah, so I've had connections with him throughout my life in uh, in in different ways and and, and more recently it's become uh, more of a professional i guess relationship in that we're both uh in 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 liturgy and church work so mm-hmm. so yeah so it's yeah so dr mcnamara teaches at benedictine university in atchison kansas he is the chair of the beauty and culture, which uh, he likes to get a laugh out of, because it in in our normal universities that is not something that would be elevated to what it is at Benedictine. So, yeah, I think uh, he presented some three presentations at Transfiguration, if you weren't there. Well, that's why we're podcasting about them, but also just kind of how they affected us in in the in a little bit. Uh, I I thought it was great. So I missed the first one because I was traveling back from the Black Hills and seeing the manifestation of God's beauty and grandeur in the mountains and the flowers and whatnot, which I, which I, I didn't ask any questions while he was here, but that was kind of one of them. You know, it wasn't really a question. I guess it was just an observation to see you know, I've experienced God's goodness and beauty in the mountains when I was younger, going up on top of mountains and just being able to see it just struck me as, wow, it struck me as something kind of ridiculous, you know, it's like uh, unnecessary, but incredibly beautiful. And if God creates this just for our enjoyment wow, he must really love us. You know, I can't create anything even remotely as beautiful as that for Teresa. You know, I'm creating yeah. like a, a, a end table or something made out of old decking, you know? Well, yeah. And the, you know, it, I'm, I'm, I'm really finding this is one of the, I'd say unusual cases in which I think it's almost always the case that when I hear a presentation or or similar, my interest in it um, drops off with the time <laughs> removed from the event. But I'm finding a little bit of different in this experience. I think that in some ways he planted a, a seed that is so profound and powerful that it can expand because... I think there's a temptation in in many of us to think Dr. McNamara, expert on church architecture and certainly uh, extremely knowledgeable about religious art. There's a temptation for him to say, give real particulars like this is beautiful. This is not. This is beautiful. This is not. This is beautiful. This is not. And to give like a, a very detailed description of why it's beautiful and and what but he he simply gave some principles which really allow for a great deal of cre- creativity in their manifestation and and what I'm what I just was inspired by what, with when when you were speaking about the mountains and the flowers is that um both Augustine and the little flower have these i think they may be talking about different sort of applications but that god's 
attributes, whether greatness or power or, or I, pers- I suppose even beauty, are, are manifest by the great variety hmm. of beautiful things. Like the little flower, in, in, she, she speaks of all the different kinds of flowers that some, some people, and I think Augustine maybe does the, the very same thing, so she presumably got it from him, but that some people, you know, there, there are some people who are the rose, but then there's others who are the lilies and others are the, I don't, I'm not a great flower of mine. So I, I don't know, but the, um, something of God, something of God's greatness and beauty and power is manifest by the fact that there's not just a single fl- kind of flower, mm-hmm. that there's this great variety of, of flowers. And, um, yeah. And I think of also those, those birds of paradise, you know, have you seen those? Those funky Is it a flower or a bird? Birds. Oh, okay. Those funky birds that do those weird dances, oh, those oh, mating sure dances know, but, okay. or whatever. Okay. I mean, they're in, they're incredibly beautiful, but it it seems it seems extravagant, you know. Yeah. I mean, all these well, flowers and the other thing about the little flower is, you know, the diversity is beautiful. You know, if if everything was a rose, it'd be like, mm, okay. I mean, the mountains wouldn't look that cool. If it was just all red roses, the whole mountain, you know. Sure. But they have these teeny little yellow flowers that kind of pop up and these white flowers and and the columbine that kind of come in quick and fall out and all these beautiful diversity of flowers. And she also says, you know, if, if I could just be one, if I could just be one of those little flowers in his garden, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's an expanse of beauty because of the the differentiation. Yeah. And I want to make sure we touch on the principle, and I may not state it perfectly, but one of the reasons there's, there's so much room for creativity and, and different manifestations, which I think is really uh, significant in keeping us as human beings with with intellects engaged in in religion is that the the beauty beauty something is beautiful when it is it reveals the truth about something something is beautiful when it reveals the truth about something and i was i'm i was in a, a little bit of a of sl- feeling slightly cantankerous this morning and one of the um so and I want to be an equal opportunity offender. Um, it is the case that um, there's a there's a difference between pretty or handsome, or maybe handsome is not the perfect word, but the different there's a difference between pretty and beautiful. Mm-hmm. There's something sort of different between handsome and and beautiful. I would say. If if handsome is the male anal- analog for pretty, um, for example, you know I by the nature of my work go to um, funerals, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, more and more often people are making what I think are very poor choices of of what they wear to a funeral. It seems that some young women, um are aware that a black dress is something that's appropriate to wear to a funeral, but your cocktail dress is not appropriate, but that's the black dress that they have. Sure. So she may be very pretty, Mm -hmm. but I would argue that it's not beautiful Mm -hmm. because it's not, it's the, 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 there's something that it's not, it's revealing in a certain way, it's revealing more, but in another way, it's revealing much less of what she actually is as a child of God. Um, There's also an aspect of it, correct me if I'm wrong, within that principle, or maybe it was a secondary principle, of it being most accurately itself. Yeah. The thing, you know, functioning most properly yeah so i want i just want to make sure i equally offend because um sure yeah uh 
so and then more and more I see guy I, I see men coming to funeral masses with jeans and a flannel shirt um, and um, sometimes the jeans are not even all of one piece there <laughs> and um, you know in the, in the in the, I'll, I'll grant that the, the he could be a handsome guy and that in another setting that would be a, a, an okay mm -hmm. thing to wear but it's not beautiful because it's it's obscuring something about who he is as a child of God in God's house there's something that's off yeah yeah there's a there's a circumstantial aspect to it right yeah and one of the most profound examples that like he tried to to he, there were two different profound examples of beauty that were not conventionally pretty or at all pretty so there was um a, a an elderly emaciated patient as far as i could tell in a bed with mother Teresa bending over and ministering to him i presume mm -hmm. him and i think almost everyone with a soul mm -hmm. would say that was a beautiful image mm -hmm. i i don't think most of us if we're being honest and we're not just trying to be like pious and wouldn't say that these are the prettiest people that we ever saw in our life it's not pretty yeah. but it's beautiful yeah and the other more profound of course was um was uh, was a um a crucifix uh, interestingly enough from a hospital i think mm -hmm. it was a dutch it's a famous crucifix i probably should know its name but where the the, the passion of the lord and the amount of blood mm -hmm. and and um and all is um is uh, a bit jarring yeah and his um, skin looked like it had lesions on it yeah so yeah very brutal so you wouldn't call it pretty no but it's it's beautiful to the extent that it reveals how much he loves us more than than a, a pretty crucifix which mm. doesn't communicate um so and I'm not advocating for th this in 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 every setting or in a church that uh, that's I, I haven't thought about it that deeply, but um, or long. But I think it's the there are really there are some terrific consequences of this notion of beauty, and it includes um, the realm of enculturation, which I think is is excellent too um because he showed us a church in vietnam which um was beautiful and, and you mentioned kind of circumstantial i would say this would fall into that that realm of circumstantial in vietnam this is a beautiful church because it's using particular colors and forms and images that communicate that this is a place where a deity dwells mm -hmm. so it's it's beautiful in that culture because it is revealing what that space is um it would i and i think and again i i'm sort of speculating I'm, i really do find this fascinating yeah and, i was thinking like the circumstantial part of it was also with that the the ski the ski lodge and the church yes. example, you know, where yes. where both of them, you could say, were beautiful yes. in their own context. Yes. You know, the ski lodge can be a beautiful ski lodge. Yeah. But it's actually not a beautiful church. Yes. And vice versa. Yes, no. I mean, the church is a, that's a beautiful church. Yes. So you can't just say like, oh, well, it's. It's completely objective yeah. just because it's it, a beautiful thing. We can use it for whatever we want. Its use has yes. to come into play. Yes, because that's the, the essence of the thing. So the the essence of the ski lodge in some, you know, I, I'm now I'm no philosopher, but I so I know enough to be dangerous. But like the essence of the ski lodge, say it's a building 
that allows skiers to enjoy their time there and be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me it, it would be it would be desirable in some ways to incorporate as long as you're able to to keep it warm and, and all those things to incorporate a significant amount of glass in the wall so that people can see these beautiful peaks that they've all come to be on. Mm -hmm. So um so it is manifesting its purpose by having that clear glass so that you can see. However, it unfortunately has become the case that in some churches they have in beautiful settings they have they have a taken on this same particular feature mm -hmm. but the church is not a place for people to gather so they can see the outside in comfort yeah the essence of a church is that it's god's house where the sacrifice takes place yeah so the Unfortunately, that the ability, Dr. McNamara, I think he said as much, and I would, as I continue to consider these principles, to see to 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 be set up in a church to be looking at the outdoors is it it's not revealing, it's obscuring what the purpose yeah. of this building and this gathering is. It um, may be pretty. Yes, I'm, yeah, it I'm may sure be it is. beautiful. In a different setting. In a different setting for a different But it's purpose. not revealing the purpose for the church. Yeah. The church is to experience the transcendence. Yeah. And that is not as easy to do when you see squirrels running around <laughs> yeah. behind the yes. altar. Yeah. You know? And that that's a great, uh, that, that helps you make a great segue too, because one of the most sort of provocative of statements that, that he said, quoting a, a fame, one of the famous 20th century earlier when they were good earlier 20th century uh, theologians um, was that the church is for the altar. Mm. The church is for the altar. The church is the setting for the altar. And that is going to be disturbing to many people, probably in the sense that they've never thought of that before. They have if they've been on building committees they they didn't use that as a principle yeah. when they when they made decisions there's there's so much that that comes from from that principle if we recognize that the the church is for the altar um the the altar itself should be beautiful and it should, in some ways, captivate. It should be the focal point. And I think it's safe to say to the extent that ornamentation helps to provide a setting for the altar and make us aware of that we are there for the altar. Um, it, it, it is beautiful and good and helpful. But there, I think there's a, there's a temptation... Um, when when one has an altar that is not captivating, to kind of fill in the, the fill in the void, and then that can become distracting. Yeah, or it's abstract. Or like abstract. He, he did that was some of his controversial stuff. I think he talked about was we when we come into a church, it should be it it ought to be very clear what it is and we should be able to rest in that we shouldn't have to be trying to figure it out i shouldn't have to you know like if i'm seeing abstract art i might have to like read the thing next to the art piece to see what it even is you yeah. know i'm seeing i go to a art museum I, i'm looking at some abstract art that can be beautiful in its context but it it's not allowing me to fully like rest in what it is and yeah. and that's not you know like to fully reveal what it truly is is the beautiful right i mean that's that's also one of the those principles it's fully revealing yeah in some ways with ease yeah what it is yeah. you know i shouldn't have to look at the crucifix and say is that a crucifix yeah. like is that 
Or is oh, it that the is tin Jesus. Man oh, that's Jesus. Okay. He, he showed a, like a metal yeah. crucifix. And like, this is so weird that it's distracting. It's not revealing. Exactly. And I should be able to rest in it. Um, some of his other things that I really liked was his observations on music. You you might like this. I don't know. Maybe you do. Yeah, I, I, uh, some of his observations on music and how even the the singing and playing of music should allow for the f- the further revealing of the truth of the words you're saying. Oh, okay. It yeah. shouldn't be uh, yeah. show tunes, you know. Yes. You know, that is, it might be catchy. Yeah. But the way, I mean, he, he obviously, maybe not obviously, sorry. So he presented the music in a way that, you know, I think he's presenting Gregorian chant and those types of chants in a way that helps manifest the truth of the words you're saying because they're going up and there's some emphasis here and there's some articulation that is allowed because of the notes and because of where they are and and how I don't know the technical words because that's that's not my expertise but it allows for us to rest in that and to experience it most fully Whereas singing a show tune to, you know, the Gloria or something doesn't really allow me to rest on the most emphasized words or there isn't an, there isn't a big high note or a low note that the, even the music is kind of like this beautiful ballet. I, I, I don't know if he emphasized it like that, but that's yeah, the way I was thinking, yeah. like, the music itself should be this ballet that's that there's grandeur and that should be emphasized as grandeur and then there's there's solemn parts yeah. and that should be emphasized well, as solemn you know yeah it, it, this is this is uh, uh, we're starting to get in territory where I'm I'm unfortunately weak and and I, but I, I I you are I think saying what he said in a principle that I believe the church well I know the church. It's counterintuitive to us, but the church wants, if there's going to be time, energy, resources, beauty in the mass, the, the church wants it to be on the essential part. So the mass parts themselves, like the Gloria, hmm. should be beautiful and well done. The opening hymn doesn't, it's not essential you can tell in a way i think because it's variable and and not even required that it's not as significant as the gloria and um so the the it's it's not beautiful objectively it's not beautiful to have sung an opening hymn and then recite the gloria because mm-hmm. you're again you're obscuring you're revert you're giving something uh, embellishment you're giving words embellishment that are less significant mm. than those that are significant mm. and um yeah so so there's yeah there's uh, uh, there's so much in music too that mm. i'm not really qualified to to speak to but yeah i think part of the reason that the the liturgy stuff has continued to sink in with me is partially because of on the way home from our vacation we listened to the the podcast with Bishop Barron and Shia LaBeouf. I don't know if you've heard of any of that, but he's, I just heard about. He's it. like converted to Catholicism because of his living with the Capuchins out in L.A. or around there, and doing this playing Padre Pio. And one of the things that he emphasized in part of his conversion was this. And I'm making this connection, so the emphasis is mine. He didn't say this, but I think he was. He talked about the Latin Mass as he says, kind of revealing secrets. He mm-hmm. says this kind of like it was. It got him out of his world. It's not. It's abrasive in a way, and he said that was a good thing because he was everything he had done in his whole life turned out to be garbage. Mm. You know, and it led him to addiction and shame and and pain and causing other people pain. And this was so different that it 
it seemed to him transcendent. And I, you know, I think in some way, you know, I'm making this, I'm now I'm making this connection with Dr. McNamara's talk the next day that I heard was he was experiencing this fullness of truth that was outside of himself. You know, he's, in some ways he was captured by it because he, he's, he even said, you know, I don't know the language, you know, and that was part of it that he liked hmm. because he couldn't kind of fake it. He couldn't kind of, it couldn't be old hat to him because sure. it's all this totally different language and he isn't, and, and also he just didn't even know what was going on. So everything captured him. He's like, what's sure. that? What's this? What's sure. that? What's going on? Oh my goodness. What? Why are we kneeling? Like, we don't kneel for anything else. Yeah, you know what no, I mean? Good point. Kneeling is like, you, you're either going to, you're giving your allegiance to something or you're getting your head chopped off. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I don't know where there's other aspects of kneeling in our culture even. Yeah. I mean, we're kneeling to give something allegiance. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm giving my life away to something. I mean, in some ways, you're martyrdom or, you know, you're submitting to the Lord. Whoever yeah. your whoever your Lord is. And and uh yeah, I think that was part of my, you know reason I wanted, you know, the altar rail as well. Yeah. Because I want I want my daughter and me, you know, I want us to this is something different. I go up to receive the Lord and I don't do it in any way I receive anything else. Yeah. Ever. And you know, I don't yeah. I don't go eat and eat on my knees yeah. at a restaurant. No, I, I don't receive food on my tongue at a restaurant. Yes. That would be completely weird. Yeah. <laughs> and we should do something it's totally different because yes. it is totally different. Yes. And that manifests the truth of it that this is not something I just put on a plate and bring back home and yes. oh I got doggy we have extra doggy bag right no 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 this goes in a sacred place after yeah. this doesn't go in a styrofoam box you know i mean yeah. even to say that sounds horrifically b bad you know yeah. even to make the analogy but yeah that this the liturgy is something that ought to bring us out of our world and the and the church itself ought to be ridiculously beautiful. You know, I think yeah. that was one of his other things is the reality of the mass is the angels and saints are here. So we should manifest that in pictures and paintings and statues and artwork that is beautiful, that reveals that truth. Yeah. And it shouldn't have to be something that I make up yeah and he and he made he made an interesting distinction which uh between liturgical and devotional art and yeah. images and i think there's um there's there's a there's a temptation and we see it in 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 lots of there's lots of churches to put devotional images which i would say um Devotional images in general tend to be uh, realistic and perhaps saccharine. Mm -hmm. um, there's a temptation to put those in the sanctuary where the because maybe because we just don't know the the fullness of of the religious tradition. I, w I would say, in in broad strokes, Doctor McNamara is Doctor McNamara is advocating for icons to be in the sanctuary because icons are not uh, intended to display the person, the saint, as they appeared on earth, but to reveal something about their glorified state and that they are worshiping god in heaven um but there's yeah there's a, like a certain theology of them They're, they they yeah. don't look like you and me you yeah know? he gave the example of um uh, a marian icon that you know her hands are disproportionately huge and her nose is elongated and and her gaze is different than it normally would you know she's she's in a posture of worship it's not you know 
She's not watching a football game or something. She's yeah. not sitting down for dinner and no icons look like normal life. Yeah, know? the tr- certainly the traditional kind of well well done ones. Yeah. Um but there's a I think a, a temptation again it's kind of like the circumstance and context that you want particular kinds of art in your sanctuary and you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily you very it's extremely likely you wouldn't want that in your home and that's okay you can have you can have the more saccharine stuff in your in your home and that's great and saccharine meaning sweet uh, and um and then have the more um yeah more not sweet but more uh, sort of serious art mm-hmm. in 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 the sanctuary. I yeah, say. that was an interesting point he made. I I because I grew up in St. Michael, St. Michael, Minnesota, and one of the examples he gave looked very much like the Saint, old St. Saint Michael Gothic yeah. church. Yeah, with this huge high altar piece that had lots of statues incorporated into it, and yep. I thought, oh. I I mean that you know and that's uh interest I thought it was an interesting point and I thought oh okay I guess yeah that is there is a difference there's a devotional aspect of it to those saints you know I think we had like Saint Anthony and Saint Michael obviously and and then there's Mary and Joseph and and um yeah, I mean, I, I guess I originally thought, you know, we have these saints because it helps us realize that the saints and angels are here with us. But uh, I, I did appreciate his point that there is a certain type of beauty that can manifest what's happening here without having those as well. You know, yeah. the kind of ornate artwork that you see in in lots of other churches is is also beautiful but doesn't kind of distract us towards those saints yeah. during mass. Yeah. You know, that's a yeah. maybe an after mass thing yeah. because it's a devotion. Yeah. You know, I think some of those realistic uh statues you would advocate for maybe having uh, niches, you know, throughout the the um, throughout the the church, but in the sanctuary there'd be a probably a, a different kind of art that's that's more appropriate. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's in some ways the analogy would be to uh, what struck me was praying the rosary during the mass. I mean, the rosary yeah. is is a is a fine prayer, obviously, but if you're praying the rosary. During the mass, you're sort of there. You're you're not. It's you're obscuring what is that is actually happening at that particular time. Yeah, and we do that. We 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 do obscure those statues during Lent. Yeah, right. We do obscure yeah. those things during Lent. We obscure, in some ways, the beautiful. You know those things that are. Uh, there's like we're kind of stripping away. Oh, we're kind of stripping away our. Yeah, I don't know if we're, I don't know. I don't know exactly how we said it. it was you know we are obscuring or stripping away kind of those imaginatory things during. Yeah, Lent poverty for the senses. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, like and our what, senses aren't. Yeah, and heightened he made, during that time. Yeah, he made a really interesting point, which is going to be hard for some people to hear. That um. You know the 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 proper decoration for Lent is not a different kind of yeah. sensory yeah. experience like a cactus or a a, sure. a sandbox. It's it's uh, it's a lack of it's, sensory it's experience. None, you just you don't just don't decorate. Yeah, and that that's that's the appropriate setting. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. It, I I really um I'm finding this to ha- this whole topic to have a a real staying power with me that just because he gave us uh principles mm-hmm. there's so many different particulars that that 
come from it that it's it's just really uh it's really yeah it's really got captured my imagination uh, of of how what all the consequences what one uh, you know I, I i guess there's some value in repeating this this idea that beauty is is revealing the truth of something and one of the it was just in a comment i don't know if he uses it regularly but he said um uh, it was in response to a question he said you know a, a bride wears a veil mm-hmm. and and one and one veil is beautiful mm-hmm. but 17 is not right and you can i mean i don't i don't know that i've ever seen a bride wearing 17 veils but i could um, i can imagine that it would 17 veils begins to obscure the bride and it 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 um it becomes a distraction and um it, it's no longer uh, it, it becomes less about the bride and the setting for the bride and mm-hmm. and more about what is all this cloth what is going yeah. on with all this cloth so um uh yeah it's there's is there an analogy to for adoration there's a minimum requirement of candles is there not uh or yeah, no. I think or I think four or six. It's four or six, right? you know, and then but like a hundred that could might put be too the much. Emphasis. Yeah, and, right? and I, I would mean, say that let some... alone the fire hazard, yeah. but <laughs> it might obscure. Yeah, what you're doing? I think that's possible. I I really do. I don't know. That's I, just popped yeah. in my head. You know? I, yeah. No, I think it's... I, hear, I I think it's four is the minimum, right? Four is recommended. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if if. Uh, you're in the middle of nowhere and you have one, you, you do one, but yeah, the um, rubric says four, yeah, four or six, but, but a hundred or 200 or an entire gigantic back altar of only candles might, uh, might be a little much Yeah, or, yeah. or flowers or something. Yeah. Tons of flowers on the altar might distract from yeah. the truth. What, what, what I, what, I recalled when we were talking about principles is that um, it, the the church in the church documents it it says don't put your nativity scene in front of the altar mm-hmm. and and I don't know that I've always understood you know some of the rules can seem arbitrary but I think I think the principle of this revealing the truth the altar is not the place where we remember that Jesus was born the part the mm-hmm. altar is the place yeah. where we remember his his sacrifice mm-hmm. and um so to um yeah and again you could talk about this more saccharine realistic but that's that's devotional art and it's beautiful everyone mm-hmm. loves a nativity scene but um you know it it's not it's not uh the the the, the sanctuary, the altar, is not really the setting for it. Yeah, that's where the circumstances come into play. Yeah. That's not what it's for. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. beautiful somewhere else. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's still a, it, it still can be a beautiful thing, yep. but it shouldn't be the focus yeah. of people's eye yeah. during Mass. Yes, that's right. And that can be... Yeah, I I really like that. I mean, our, our culture certainly doesn't have, you know, uh, an understanding that, or a sentiment even that there is objective truth to these things. So that that's that's definitely the first argument. But I I think some of that can kind of be. I mean, I don't think people really do that. Or, or function that way in real life. And my, I was going to bring up to him my understanding, you know, of someone that says, you know, beauty is in the eye, you know, he brought this up, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. How dare you tell me that it's, I can be manifesting, I think that church that looks like a log cabin is beautiful church. And, but he's saying, well, there's a, this church is that, you know, there's something to a church and it and there's something to a log cabin that's drastically different there's something objective about it my my thought was i've never seen a person you know lots of people are colorblind they have these colorblind 
sunglasses. Have you seen these I, or heard I mean, about I them? Don't, I don't know. This is a so they do exist. They're kind of expensive, I guess. But I've seen many videos of people receiving them as a gift. And I have never seen a single one where the person put them on and thought, eh, I'd rather see the other way. Interesting. Every single time the person is in tears. Wow. Tears. Isn't that something? And they're just, they're, it's like their life has changed. Yeah. They, and they look and they, you can see this all the time. I mean, yeah, they're yeah. in tears. I mean, they're just shedding tears like a yeah. child, like grown men, grown women. I, I saw a bride give them to her husband the day of their wedding, oh. and he put them on before the wedding, and he was he was just – he's in tears. Yeah. And that – you can't say, oh, well, that's subjective. Yeah. Oh, well, seeing a black and white picture is actually more beautiful than a color picture. No, you might like it in certain settings. Yeah. It might look cool yeah. because of certain kind of aspects yeah. of the paint, of the picture, but – objectively no yeah you know and no these person these people that receive these sunglasses i have never seen a single one say eh, i'd rather see less color yeah i'd rather see these things as more bland and kind of you know five six seven different colors i i don't i don't want to see all these how ugh, this is an insult to my god-given eyesight yeah no, there is an objectivity of it's more true to be able to see all the colors. Yeah. It's more beautiful. And yeah. that's why and that's what you see with these people. They're bawling because yeah. they're the the world they're seeing is finally being fully manifest to them. And it's just they're awestruck and they're yeah. you know they're no, that's weeping. such a good example. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, I think that's a great one to end on. Well, I haven't seen that. I should. I should look that up. I think that's. Uh, I'll send you. I'll send you a, a colorblind glasses video. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Well, thank you. I do hope there are some other video. We 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 didn't record his talk because he wanted to use a a screen, and I think that actually it helped a ton because oh, we gosh, were able to we give had to lots of examples yeah. and churches and Absolutely. paintings and whatnot. There are some other YouTube videos of him. You know, on on the YouTubes, as the kids say, you can look up Dr. Dennis McNamara. He's got a couple talks. They're wonderful. They're they're great. Also, just talk to someone that you know went to the talk. Or yeah, I think uh, yeah, I I agree with you. This this talk is something that has been lingering in my head and my brain. And like, well, how can we how can we do this better? That's what I've been thinking. How can we how can we make manifest better what's what's happening here at mass and what's happening here at transfiguration to help people enter in more fully and to experience that so i uh we got a lot of work to do but i'm ready to do it yeah and what what i think is is so helpful is that um that he we've received principles not yeah not a plan with a great amount of detail and, and the principles allow for creativity mm -hmm. and allow it to be interesting and how in your particular circumstances, how to do something beautiful, which is going to be, is going to be different. And, mm -hmm. and the particulars are going to be different. I mean, maybe not wildly different in any given um, church in, in, in Minnesota, but but it allows for for creativity, and it's it's exciting. I think. Yeah, a hundred different churches can be beautiful and be very different. Yeah, and they can they can still manifest the truth in the the context they're at. Well, yeah. good. Thank you, Father Lynch. My pleasure. Uh, you mind saying a prayer for us? No, let, let's do that. Yeah. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Father, we. We praise you for you are God and you are the source of all that is good. We we thank you for the gift of our faith in Jesus and for our lives. We thank you for Dr. McNamara who has shared his his wisdom with us. We 
ask that you would give us all the, the graces and help that we need to implement the the principles of, of beauty and truth that we've received and we, we, we pray that that this will help us to bring Christ to all those in the East Metro and beyond. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.